Welcome everyone to Mail Fuzz TV. I am Peter, that is Tara, and we are going to talk about Star Trek Strange New World Season 1, Episode 6. It's called Lift Us Where Suffering Cannot Reach. So full spoilers for the episode, as always. Uh, this episode, Pike has a lady friend. Mm-hmm. An alien lady friend. This is a very Kirk-like action, I, I would say. Yeah. Very reminiscent, sure. Yes. Uh, because... We've already seen him with a lady friend in the pilot episode. <laughs> well, I sure, but this is... This is... This, yeah, you're right. This is the one that proves he gets around in the galaxy. Yeah, yeah. This is an alien lady as well. So this is like... <laughs> This is like an old fling. Well, not even a fling. It sounds like it was unrequited. It was just flirtations last time they met. But here mm-hmm. they, uh, they, they, they hook up properly. But uh, they get a distress call. There's a ship being attacked by another ship. And they come in and they try to just do some warning shots with the enemy ship. But the ship moves and gets completely ripped in half. Uh, the ship that they saved... Then the passengers beam aboard, and would you believe it, uh, one of them is this woman that Pike has met before, the last time he was in this sector, about a decade ago. And there's immediate chemistry, flirtation, so much so that Una is kind of, like, got this, like, smirk in her face, and... She steps out of the scene for a while. <laughs> yes. Uh, there's a moment later on as well where uh, she says something to Pike in front of a few of them, and Spock just sort of slowly turns, like... What is happening here? I do not understand. <laughs> this is illogical. This is most illogical. <laughs> oh, Vulcans. <laughs> I don't understand you crazy beings. Like, me and my bright to be just stare at each other in complete monotone <laughs> and then have sex. <laughs> why, why are you not like this? <laughs> hey, they, what they have seems to work. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so... Uh, so there's a, there's it's a, very, a it's very logical cuddling afterwards, also. Logical cuddling, okay. All right, that sounds like an unfair conversation, but I need to know what logical cuddling is. But um, <laughs> just watch the last episode. <laughs> um, so the plot goes down a place where uh, so Alora is the woman, and she is part of a planet where. All of their cities and civilization are on floating, like, islands, basically. And they have a child who's like the chosen one, uh, the, the what, uh, servant something, what they called them? First servant? First servant. And that's who they had on the ship. That's who these, these bad guys were after, is they wanted to kidnap the first servant, possibly for a ransom, maybe for some other reason. And... His biological father is there, although they make it very clear that because he's the first servant, he doesn't have a family. So he's just there in a, a sort of professional, like, sort of parental... Yeah, what does he say? Like, they asked if he's the father, and he says, biologically speaking, only. Yes, on purely biological <laughs> purposes only. Uh, so that sort of sets things up i mean it, it obviously it goes places though as, as it is it furthers in it's a very original series plot in a lot of ways because I, I i do remember a lot of original series episodes where they encounter a civilization but the civilization has a crazy like ritual or like you know i think you'll find that this episode was written by gene roddenberry this is actually oh. a leftover script from tls oh. of course yes i mean when they I mean, did tweaked, the, of course. when they did these episodes in the original <laughs> series, like they didn't have the the budget to do floating islands with like flying cars and all hey, sorts of shit. The show promises us strange new worlds and it <laughs> delivers. Okay, uh, <laughs> so that's, that's actually funny to hear that because it is it, it felt very classic and it's like way although uh, to- also classic in its lesson at the end. Sure. Um, however, though, I will say two things. Um, one is that. Uh, this got much darker than the original series would ever have done. Uh, mm-hmm. We literally see like a, a dead child at one point later on, and it's like, oh, okay, that does your your sort of kind of gory moment that you would never have seen on a classic Trek show. I'll say that uh, I really like this episode. I suspected while watching it that you would like this episode too, since it has like, uh, I don't want to say like uh, child torture in it. <laughs> <laughs> Because you hate kids. That's a bold claim. Uh, <laughs> what I will say, though, is that 
I tended not to like these episodes that much in the original series. Uh, and by these episodes, I mean they meet a culture. The culture's kind of weird. They've got some custom that's going like going to make them question if they should intervene or not. And then ultimately, whatever. Um, I think... Oh, this is maybe the point I was going to make earlier, actually. The ending of this is actually also a lot darker. It's the sort of thing where Next Gen would do an ending like this, where it's kind of a bitter ending where they fail to actually solve the problem. And it, it's like, you know, like, and Picard would have to accept, oh, we failed here and that's sad and we have to kind of accept that failure. Uh, there's kind of a similar ending here where, like, Alora clearly is in love with Pike and wants Pike to accept her customs and ways, but Pike's like, nah, peace out, beam me up, number one. <laughs> like, I'm going. <laughs> and it's this sort of cold exit of like, no, I can Thanks never be a part of this. Thanks for the I'm out. <laughs> yeah, I can never be a part of this. I'm gone. And it's a very bitter moment and it feels like a kind of a, a, a state. You know, it felt like, an, like for as much as this felt like an original series style story, I don't see the original series quite pulling that ending. Uh, mm. and, and, and the same way, at least as harshly as it does. So, uh, I think I think that's worth mentioning as well. But I, I would say that I actually I surprisingly did kind of like this episode the more it went on because it did swerve me in a couple of different ways. Like, um, obviously it kind of twists and turns as to who the villains are, and then you realize it's wrapping up too soon, and you're like, oh god, what what's the custom? What's this ascension ritual they're going to do with this child? Clearly, this is going to be bad because we've got too much time left for this to just be a happy <laughs> ending now. Uh, there's like 20 there minutes left of the episode. There are throughout the episode too that I picked up on. Oh, for sure. Uh, and then what, one of the other things that it spurred me on as well is um, it teases that they have fancy medical technology and it might be just what Mbenga needs to save his daughter and it remains as of his daughter because he's seen her again early mm-hmm. in the episode. And when they take this kid, the, you know, the, the, the chosen one, to the med bay, and like it turns out like the the father slash doctor because he's also a doctor uh just wanted to scan him to make sure his implants were working because everyone in this society has fancy like nano implants that will just fix stuff and so they don't get diseased they don't get sick so he's just making yeah. sure they're working and then begging his eyes light up he's like oh what is this magical don't have disease huh? what's the what's the <laughs> space tech you speak of may i inquire about it and the kid's listening to them as they're talking about this, and he's, like, giving them, like, the, the quote-unquote hypothetical of, like, this daughter, the patient. <laughs> yeah, could be... of this, yeah. yeah, this girl patient, young young girl patient. Yeah, about 11 years uh, old. A friend of mine. Yeah. You don't know him. <laughs> but the kid's listening, and I thought, oh, because they, they keep, they, they harp on it a couple of times. I think Alora says it a couple of times to Pike that they're very private. They don't let, you know, share their technology or anything with outsiders. They don't let their outsiders be at their things. So, Which, um, also, the doctor guy says to Mbenga, like, uh, I believe your culture also has that, where if it's, if that culture is not as advanced as you, don't give them technology to give them the advantage. They're talking about it, and the kid's listening to them, and I thought, oh, the kid's about to ascend and become, because at this point in the episode, it sounds like he's going to become their leader, obviously, as, as we go on, that turns out to be the case, but I thought, oh, this kid's going to, like, change the rule. Because he's going to hear about this girl who needs to be saved, and especially when we see him playing with her, because, you know, Mbenga comes in and he's, like, mm-hmm. woken her up, and he's they're playing, like, hopscotch or something, because uh, he's made fancy, like, like, coloured, like, gas circle clouds <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the floor. Um, and it's a sweet moment, and, like, oh, he cares about her, he cares about Mbenga, he's going to do something. He's going to use his new powers as, as being the king of this planet to to save them, or to save her. But then, of course, it flips around and, you, you know, because early on, it's like the dad's the one who's like, no, I can't share this with you. So I thought it was actually kind of a neat swerve later on in the episode that after the dad turns out to be someone who was trying to have the kid kidnapped by the others, but then it turns out he's having the kid kidnapped by the others because he wants to save his son because what the chosen one is is to be a battery that's plugged into the, the <laughs> system of these this planet that yeah, keeps all the planets floating. <laughs> it's basically like a really cruel version of like the planet in Babylon 5, except that it's like, we do this to a child and the child will be dead and they don't have a choice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, kid, well, yeah, it's a little, it's a little Borg-like, also. Um, but yeah, the kid doesn't have a choice, and he does suffer the whole time. They say, yeah, right? it has to be done to some a kid at, at about eleven years old. Yeah. Just the original designers made it this way, and they don't know why, but we, they, uh, they should, have to choose. Somebody. We should point out they do sort of like, 
he does say that he chooses to do it before he goes in so they do kind of like pretend there's a choice but he's like chosen like what what do they do if he says no i don't want to do this like yeah i mean i, I, not... I don't know they seem like they were screwed when he they thought he was dead yeah yeah they, they, she literally says all, all of her cities are going to fall out the sky into the lava below <laughs> and like, oh. lava and acid pools and <laughs> <laughs> that sounds very sounds hostile that's, that sounds worse than australia what's, what's down there yeah it's pretty gnarly <laughs> um i'm sure they have uh, every poisonous creature in australia is also on this planet that's where yes. it comes from <laughs> yes that's what i was referencing by the way i have nothing against the people of australia just for the record <laughs> no. um so so that's that's pr- that's pretty dark and stuff. So th- what I liked about this swerve is that it, by the end of the episode, it's actually the dad as a fellow doctor and as someone who wanted to save his child comes to him Beng and says, "Look, I can't show you exactly the technology, but I can talk you through in theory what it would be doing, and maybe that's a start in helping you to like figure something mm-hmm. out." So he's actually the one that offers it up, and it's not that the kid turns out to be evil because that that would be a complete fifty fifty swerve where the kid's now the evil one. That's not obviously the case, but. Uh, the fact that the dad turns out to be a decent dude uh, and was doing things for the right reason and the fact that everyone who was trying to take the kid was actually doing it to save him because they all think this is monstrous what they do to the one kid yeah. is an interesting idea. And, you know, uh, the big, you know, the message, uh, you know, like when Pike's debating this, because when Pike realizes what's about to happen, he tries to intervene and obviously the guards like knock mm-hmm. him out and whatever. Uh, when he sees the other dead kid, because you know, they're basically wheeling out the old dead kid like and it's not like he's he like looks a, fried yeah and i think the most important thing here it's not like this this was like a, someone who became a man in this machine this clearly has to be replaced at most or at least every two years or something like that because this yeah this was not like someone who had aged to like a, a bigger height really this was someone about the same size no yeah it looks like the kid would just like burn very slowly over time to the point where like even his eye sock his eyes are like still wide open and like burned that way like he died in pain yeah but only like maybe like at most two years before they have to get another kid oh, yeah yeah because you can't grow too much yeah because that's still look like someone of a similar height so i'm like did like... you have to read the uh the short story the lottery when you were in school i don't think so if i did i don't remember it yeah, I can't remember who wrote it. Uh, say Sylvia something. I'm not sure, but uh, the lottery was a short story that I had to read a couple times in uh, different schools. But it basically every year, it's like uh, like the Pilgrims or something. <clears throat> Some I, I want to say it's the Pilgrims in like the New World. There's a small town where they have to select somebody in the town to be the chosen one and sacrifice in order for their corn to grow otherwise they don't get crops and nobody eats so every year there's a lottery where it's totally random like just whoever gets selected has to go in a circle and the, <laughs> like during the harvest moon or something and get stoned to death so it's a slow painful process of dying <laughs> but it's all for the good of the community and uh, I have a feeling this episode was uh, very influenced by that short story. Or even just like the trolley problem in ethics, you know? Do you sacrifice one to save a bunch of people or um, that kind of an issue? I mean, I think it's important that after he wakes up, after being knocked out, and Alora still clearly cares about Pike, wants him to stay, wants mm-hmm. to convince him this is the right thing to do, and they have to just accept it. Yeah. She says, like, can you honestly say that there's no children... And, you know, in your civilization that are either, you know, poor or in poverty or, or slave labor or something. My, my gut reaction was no. I mean, for the Federation anyway. Well, yeah, but... no, that's, that's the point I was going to make is that I thought in the Federation technically there wouldn't be. But at least from a present day perspective, and you hear this, she's saying, look, yeah, we have yeah, one yeah. child who has to go through hell but only one and we all accept it we all know it's happening we're not looking away mm-hmm. and it's like okay i can hear the critique of like the world when she says that but just but yeah the federation it feels like it's not supposed to have that but then again the federation is made up of a lot of planets and okay at, th- at this point in the timeline like say the klingons aren't in, in this federation yet because this is pre-original series but mm-hmm. like 
and I'm not saying they have exactly poverty necessarily, but you know, I, I don't necessarily imagine the Klingons having a system where children aren't going through hell because it sounds like they all go through hell when they're getting raised. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I definitely said no to my television when she asked that question. <laughs> but, you know, the point is for to you for you to think of your own society now. That's yes. what, you know, good science fiction does. And sure, like I really enjoy using my cell phone and I don't know what I would do without like in society today without cell phones and I know that they're mined by children for cobalt and stuff like that. But like I, you can't function without one now. Like, even homeless people have found a way to get cell phones because, like, what, what, they can't, people can't live without them now. Yeah. And I think it's also worth saying that even though, in theory, the Federation is not supposed to have things like that, it's so vast and has so many worlds and, like, civilizations yeah, we don't under know it. For sure. Yeah. yeah. Like, I, I think it's like, like she's basically saying, can you say for sure that none of that goes on with with any members of the Federation? I mean, they, they have I don't children think... on their ships when they travel and go to war and stuff. So, quite frankly, I don't think Pike can say with a hundred percent certainty. No, there's absolutely, definitely not a single child who has suffered suffering right now to to make the Federation work or make one mm-hmm. of the planets in the Federation work. Like he can't say that for sure because it may still go on in secret, right? there's no guarantee so it still kind of works even though in theory the federation is supposed to be past things like that right yeah yeah so these yeah. people will never be accepted into the federation and i like that there are there's another society well, not now <laughs> no. uh yeah they have rules against that kind of stuff but um but i like that there is another planet that has been colonized by these same people uh, originally who yeah, like, like we're not going to we're not going to do this it's not worth the price it's like a splinter group so presumably it's, a, it's a, at some point in time this group was like you know what no let's move somewhere else yes <laughs> let's just maybe not we live should here. throw away our, our our smartphones yeah and they still Everybody. have ships it's not like they're living in complete stone age <laughs> you know they've, they've got little battle cruisers they're flying about yep. Yeah, and they're not they're not bitter about not having as much as the other colony. They're just upset at the whole foundation of their colony. I think we have to talk about a few things that the episode does that's what separates it. Because I said I surprisingly like this when I don't necessarily like a lot of the original series episodes that are kind of like this. Is that I think this does a pretty decent job of making you like the kid to the point where he feels like a proper character. I, I think he's quite good in this. Yeah, he like they, they sort of teach you that he's quite smart. Um, the like he like he's almost too smart in a weird way, but yeah, he has an interesting conversation with Spock to where like it almost looks like Spock smiling at him, like he's impressed by the kid. Yeah, yeah, he earns some points with Spock by uh, talking about sp- station relays or something like that, mm-hmm. radio relays. Um, but there's like the whole thing where when he figures out where Mbenga's daughter is, like, hidden in the transporter memory, he says something to the effect of, you know, I just, you know, I, th- I couldn't find anything, so I looked in the medical records and I figured, oh, where would I hide? And that's actually, believe it or not, set up for something he does later, because when the dad tries to sneak him off the ship and he's, like, he's he's got another ship nearby to transport them... And the Enterprise, you know, they all react quite strongly to the fact, wait a minute, how did they beam out of here without any of us noticing? Or, like, you know, without any warning? And it turns out that they can do that if they have very precise, like, records. And it turns out the dad had just scanned both of them out of the system and sent it over so they had, like, pinpoint accurate, like, data. And because they were about to transport, obviously the shields were down. So it made sense that there were shields were down. Anyway, so that made sense. Uh, but it turned out the kid actually, like, predicted this or whatever and, like, beamed himself to somewhere else in the Enterprise. So there's actually, like, a good, like, couple of minutes where everyone thinks the kid is dead. Now, mm-hmm. admittedly, did, did you think he was... I, I was like, no, I, I didn't see a body. He's not dead. That was my uh, attitude. I'm pretty gullible when it comes to this kind of stuff. <laughs> so when, when it blew up, I kind of went... <gasps> I can't believe they did that. And then I went, ah, he's not dead <laughs> after that. <laughs> but in the moment, yeah, I was yeah. surprised. I-, I was pretty convinced that he was still alive, but we still got a good couple of minutes though where Pike has to explain to Alora that, oh, by the way, yeah, the kid's dead. <laughs> and like, it's it's all very, you know, like dour and everyone's like acting really sad and talking about how much of a tragedy it is. And 
they all kind of like or at least the ones who interacted with them kind of liked the kid so like you know everyone's feeling a bit down about it but then spock like you know detects a, a beacon and it's basically the kid sending out a distress call from the box that he beamed himself into so it doesn't last <laughs> too long but when they find them it's kind of a big moment and it's like wait a minute this feels at the end of the episode but there's like almost 20 minutes left was there must <laughs> I, did, be more. I didn't check the time but mm. i kind of suspected from the beginning that uh since i was getting lottery vibes for the kid they said he was selected at random through mm. the lottery and um like the alora kind of had some shifty eyes you know when she was talking about the aliens that were attacking and yeah, uh, about the was... rituals and stuff so i i kind of was suspecting something was going to happen for a while and it, I also was getting vibes that the doctor wasn't who he said he was, that he was on the other side. Um, yeah, it felt like she, any time she was asked questions about any of the rituals or, yeah, who this alien race, or, because she sort of said, oh, it's a different alien race on a different planet that we've, we've lived peacefully with for a long time. I don't know why mm-hmm. they would do this. And it's like, wait, they're actually a splinter group of your race who are just politically, like, opposed to the horrible things you're doing. Yeah, uh, thanks to Uhura. Yeah, so Hera uses her, her skills, uh, which I guess leads us into the, the subplot, uh, where La'an is basically... Ahura is assigned to work with her and train with her in the methods of security, and La'an is a pretty tough drill sergeant where she's constantly making her work around the clock, she's giving her impossible tasks, she's very stern about everything she does, to the point where Pike even cracks a couple of jokes about it with Ahura and the, the turbo lift at the start. Not just Pike, yeah, a lot of people mm-hmm. have... Uh, I think, uh, well, we see Sam Kirk again, and he also has something to say about it. Yeah, he's in the cafeteria. He didn't uh, die this episode, though, and that was disappointing. <laughs> I don't know. I would say that Laanne metaphorically killed him with the daggers in the eyes that she was giving him. <laughs> so I'm willing to count that. Uh, <laughs> but I think Ortega has a line at the other start as well when they first walk on the bridge. Uh, the, 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 one that, mm-hmm. the one that made me laugh, though, was... Um, so Lan gives her this job to like look through the wreckage of the the ship from the start of the episode and like sort of try and translate all these different things, and when Ahura like comes to her and says, "Okay, I did what you asked. I went through everything and I translated it, and here it is, and this was important." And Lan's like response is like, "Oh, so you did the bare minimum of what I asked?" And I'm like, "What? So and uh, this is not true. It turns out Ahura also went went one more than that and figured mm-hmm. out a whole bunch of extra stuff. But let's just say she hadn't." Right? How could she possibly be critical? She asks Ahura to do a job. Ahura says, I did the job. You just did what I asked and no more? <laughs> like, yeah, that's uh, well, that's a very boot camp thing to do. And she is a cadet here underneath the... Like, is she a lieutenant? I'm not quite sure yet. I don't really know the yeah, characters I, I all that will, well yet. But. I will tell anyone in any, any branch of military, the reaction I will give to you if you say that to me will be this. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> anyone who's been in the military knows uh you can't do that <laughs> well that's why i've never been in the military because I, I i would not be able to put up with the bullshit and the yes. the pomp and circumstance of the chain of command right well no enterprise in your future then i'm okay with that but, uh, um yeah so uh i like this plot um I, you know i already like all these characters and getting to see them various pairings of them because we've seen La'an with Uhura in the second episode where Uhura already had to prove herself and her linguistic skills so uh and and La'an was very cold to her there too so she's I think she's just treating her different because she's a cadet so she's still like you know you're you're just a boot you're just um uh a fresh fresh from from the school and uh you need to have some more discipline and we expect more, especially if you're on the Enterprise. Yeah. Uh, does she seem to warm up to her a little bit after these findings? And what were they, Tara? They were that the um, the messages that she decoded from the alien species, uh, she decoded the messages and was able to like take the roots of the words and realize that they had the same origin as the planet Um Magellan? <laughs> there was something with like that. I wasn't able to try that, yeah. and remember it. <sighs> I, I think it's something around, about Magellan. <laughs> so yeah, so there, this colony that's attacking them uh, from or this planet is just another colony that's from the same planet. 
but two separate ones. Yeah. I think one of the other comparisons to the original series I'd make is, again, this is just like a budget and like modern times thing, but like whenever you'd meet a culture like this in the original series, it was like, like a main, two main characters and like five extras and like a square room with some set dressing. In here, mm-hmm. it's like, you know, the, the, I mean, I'm sure some of them are just CG, but it feels like there's a lot of extras in the background and it feels like there's big, vast spaces to look at. <laughs> it feels like yeah. it, it looks... It looks expensive, as the show has done throughout, <laughs> but it, it it sold me on the idea that this was actually an idyllic planet, whereas whenever they said that in the original series, it was like, yeah, but this is a room. <laughs> this is like yeah, two rooms. Yeah, this is just like a leftover Spartacus set yeah. that you're using. <laughs> this is t- two rooms in a hallway. I, I, I'm not it's getting... It's very ancient Greece, <laughs> but with, with jumpsuits. <laughs> uh, oh, my favorite one's... Uh, I want to say it was season three. I could be wrong, but... It, where the Western set that they were using wasn't mm-hmm. finished, so they came up with a reason in the plot for why it was just the fronts of the Western buildings and not the whole buildings. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The Futurama, Futurama episode makes fun of that also. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah I, I, uh, I, I thought it was pretty funny. I don't know. I, maybe it's just because I'm a Trek fan, but like, you know, these alien races we come across are always, they're human, but with one little like nose bit or ear bit or a forehead bit. Um, and even her name is just a human name with an A in front of it. <laughs> I, th- I found that was kind of funny. How many it, humans? That's very reminiscent of old Star Trek, you know. How many humans do you know named Laura? <laughs> Laura? It's not Laura. It's Laura. A Laura. Oh well, Laura is seems pretty common enough. Uh, is it? Are you one of these Americans who thinks it's Laura Croft? <laughs> no, I think it's like Laura Dern. <laughs> No, Laura, Alora. Look, I know it's spelt differently, but it's pronounced the same. What's well, not? Laura, Alora. Okay. <laughs> you can fight me if you like, but uh, <laughs> I will fight you in this. Is, I, Laura and Laura sound exactly the same to me. <laughs> no, Laura is like it's like you're saying the word law and then ra, Laura, right? And then yeah. Laura is like the word law. And then Ra. Yeah, L A U R and L O R are the same where I'm from. If it was Alora, it would sound like you're saying, hey, look, there's Alora standing over there. There's another Laura. <laughs> oh, no? Okay. Look, I'm pretty tired, so my, my attempts at comedy right now might be a little subpar, but. Uh, pity me, please. <laughs> No? Okay. Uh, I, subpar is not the word I would use. Slightly under par? Annoying. Uh, annoying? <laughs> Alora and Pike uh, <laughs> do have a romantic connection in the middle of the episode where he's like, you should have a bodyguard because more gu- people from the other side might try and come and get you. And she's like, why don't you just come in with me? And protect me from within. And he's like, eh, it's tempting. And then she kisses him and he's like, yeah, all right then. <laughs> then it's a little something for the ladies who want to see shirtless Pike. That's true. That's true. He's got his shirt off. Mm-hmm. Um, and he says, don't touch the hair. There's like a million pounds of moose in it. <laughs> There's no moose in that. That's, that's natural hair. That's just... <laughs> Uh huh. <laughs> that, that's natural peak perfection. Is what that is. I was pleasantly surprised after thinking early on that I wasn't sure what I was going to feel about the episode because it was you know it was doing some plot threads that like. But oh, the good thing about this though is that it's not done them five times already. Whereas the original series, like there were certain types of episode that would repeat a lot. And this type of episode was one of them. This and, like, Finding the Godlike Being. Like, those were the two that, like, kind of happened over and over again. So, the beauty of this is that it's not happened before yet. And also, the season's only 10 episodes long, so they're not going to do this again. Like, we're not going to get a second one of these this season. No, no, no. Like, this is I don't is think it. that there's going to be any filler. Like, just run that script again. Yeah, no, <laughs> But not put at a all. different type of meatloaf on their heads. <laughs> That's a good way of putting it, yeah. Meet the fun. <laughs> I, I I didn't come up with that. There was no one else. Okay. <laughs> I was gonna. I was willing to give you credit for it, but the fine. Be honourable. Yeah, we saw we saw uh, other Kirk again. Uh, we get a lot of horror this episode, of course. We did get a little bit of Chapel. 
uh, interacting with the kid. Uh, but this this was one where it was mostly a Pike episode, but we got a decent amount of Mbenga, I would say, uh, mm-hmm. as a secondary character, and then everyone else was kind of there in supporting roles. I, I was glad that they didn't wrap up the uh, the daughter storyline. I want that to be a thing where he doesn't like find a cure until he's, you know, super white-haired and stuff like that. And his kid's still, like, 11 years old and stuck in the... Yeah. Transported code. Uh, yeah, and there's a sad little detail here that sometimes he sort of tells her he's going back in, but sometimes she just beams in mid sentence and doesn't even isn't even aware that time's passed. Mm-hmm. So he's he's trying to like sugarcoat the truth of like how long she's been kind of like in stasis, effectively. Uh, yeah, which is a little sad, but. Yeah, I guess I still have questions about how the transporters work. Then, like, is it an instant thing or? Because we have had episodes like. Uh... Like Barclay when he sees the 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 speaking of meatloaf, little meatloaf wormy things. Yeah, that that <laughs> one makes no sense really. Like when you stop and think about it, like n- nothing else in the sh- in any of the Star Treks I have seen have ever implied that you are in any way conscious whilst. Yeah, well, there's also uh, there is an episode of Enterprise where the transporter systems are new and there's a character who's very afraid of them, and she kind of has uh, hallucinate uh, hallucination while she's going being transported as well so i don't know but although i think we did see in the new trek uh, people being transported from their perspective and it was instant wasn't it yeah. if you remember yeah okay so i guess that's all that yes yes they, they're not aware when they're inside yeah uh <laughs> so yeah yeah uh but yeah, uh, no, honestly, I don't think the show has had a bad episode. If anything, no I would... I, yeah, looking back, I'd say maybe episode two is probably the weakest one, but all, but mainly just because like the rest have been better since. Yeah, but I, I really did like Ahura's character a lot in that episode. And, oh, there was and good stuff in Spock it, yeah. Spock and... Yeah, they've all been really strong, honestly. Like, it's been a really good show. Yeah, it's 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 kind of doing a greatest hits of Star Trek style plots, but it is adding its own little spins on it. Like I say, like the the coldness of the ending where Pike just leaves Alora like when she's begging him to stay, and it's like no, like you, this is a line that I will never accept, and like you you just willingly cross it. Like this is it. Yeah. Like like we're done now. Like any hope of us being something is done. Yeah, <laughs> although he did say like now number one, um. Where before he was like sleeping and unconscious before then. So like, I don't know. Did he text her? <laughs> Do their communicators text? <laughs> I'm going to say now and then you beat me up. Um, um, or maybe she just knows now is always a command for beam up. Maybe he tapped his communicator so number one could hear the whole conversation. <laughs> but it's the flippy ones. Oh, true. Yeah, it's not, it's not next gen era where they can just go yeah. dip and yeah, that's true, that's true. That's their dog tag is the is the insignia. Um, I will say, you know, I, I like I did like Pike a lot in this episode. Um, there wasn't too much of the Pike stuff that I, I don't like. I, I do think it's kind of funny that um, these emperor or for the sake of this uh, this chosen ones like guard where they're like they devote their lives to combat and to protecting whoever has been chosen. Um, we're, we're sure we're easy to defeat by Pike <laughs> in the beginning when they found like the traitor and he was running away it's and just, Pike stops him. It's because the red shirt villains basically is the answer Yeah, to that. I thought that was a little disappointing, you know. Uh, I know he gets knocked out at the end when he's trying to save the kid by one of them, but he wasn't really fighting. It was like him against, you know, like four of them or something. Yeah. So, I don't know. They seemed like a, a little bit of pushovers for people who were sworn to protect sure. him. I do think it's kind of funny, actually. And I didn't, this is not a complaint, but it's kind of funny how there's two scenes in this episode where a ship they're trying not to destroy, they end up inadvertently destroying. And yeah, there's a lot of accidental deaths in this episode. <laughs> and, and, and to be fair, in both cases, it's kind of the ship's fault, the other ship's fault that this is happening. You know, the first yeah. one sort of, like, dodges into the blast, and then the second ship is trying to warp drive whilst they're, like, on a tractor beam, and... Pike actually gives the order to turn the tractor beam off because this he knows it's going to destroy their ship. So he's like, okay, turn it off. But unfortunately, it's just a little, just a smidge too late and it goes boom. 
Uh, but yeah. so there's there's two moments in this episode where like a ship explodes and like oh crap people just died and like they and obviously the second one's really bad because they think the kid's on it <laughs> but yeah uh, and they're all like oh no <laughs> yeah uh, that that's true I did note the uh, uh, more accidental death in this episode than we've seen so far and also props to them for making us care about the kid having the kid go through yeah. with it us seeing him in pain. And then them not somehow rescuing him by the end. No, they have to leave the planet and accept that this kid is going to be tortured until he dies and they can't do it. I anything. like the connection scene too with the little like wormy things coming out mm. and attaching to his brain. I just, I, th- I thought that was really good that it just, it you know, it had the balls to just like let that sit. Yeah. And just like they, they don't fix it. They don't save it. They have and to it's just. it's a child. Yes. They just have to accept it. Uh, and it's like, okay, well, write this planet off and never join the Federation unless they abolish this nonsense because we're not, <laughs> we're not dealing with this yeah. crap. The other colony, though, they're cool. Oh, yeah, the other colony <laughs> may be all right. Maybe, maybe they can get, like, separate entry. Uh, maybe, maybe, yeah. Well, because that's the thing. If if they become part of the Federation, then the, their Federation jurisdiction... Because, you know, that's, that pops up a lot in this episode where, like, Alora keeps saying, well, you can't do it, I think, because you're not... You're, you're Federation and we're not Federation. Mm-hmm. And Pink... Yeah, nah, 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 nah. And Pike gets around that a little bit early by saying, well, you can have a friend with you, right? I'll, I'll just... I was like, I thought he was going to change his clothes, but he shows up in, like, complete uniform with his phaser, and I was like... Yeah, I thought that was weird, too. I, I noticed that. I thought... Like, you change? Maybe well, now, she did say she liked the uniform. Yeah. I was like, okay, if there was ever a time for that stupid green shirt, like, now's <gasps> the time for the casual. Yeah. <laughs> he burned through it last week. It got too dirty on his whatever adventures he went on well i guess he was just doing a diplomacy thing yeah he was at a meeting um <laughs> i hope the next episode is hammer based <laughs> oh yeah no hammer again this episode i want hammer and sam kirk to have an adventure <laughs> <laughs> i just want a comedy episode again <laughs> yeah you may get one more comedy. I, I could see like episode eight being maybe like a comedy episode i could, I could see this having another serious episode uh. A comedy and two serious episodes to and then to, the last serious episode has a has a cliffhanger of some well, kind. well the last serious episode has to have the garden reveal we have to see the garden the last oh, episode actually there was something spoiled for um the show like before it even came out so maybe that's going to be in the last episode okay you heard the picture that was going around not off the top of my head but doesn't mean i didn't see it i mean i just forgotten about okay. it Look at you sitting over there with your... your, your well, no, your... I, now I'm debating, do I show it to you? Because if you forgot, then I don't want to ruin it for you. But I know that I've shown it to you before, so if you forgot it, then maybe that's good. Okay. Sitting over there with your throne of secrets. <laughs> You're just yeah. going to look it up anyway. <laughs> uh, maybe not, I don't know. So, uh, uh. Uh, but there you go. That is a uh, Strange New Worlds episode six. Uh, still enjoying the show, and it's not to say that it's not like without some like quibbles or faults. Or, you know, like yeah, Pike is okay still. By no means is anyone saying it's perfect. And you know what? Like there was a moment here. See when uh, Laad and Ahura go to the crash ship. You know, for the start of the episode, and they're going to investigate it. Mm-hmm. Right? There is a fancy camera move. But here's something I'm going to point out is that the fancy camera move is completely justified by what it's showing you because it does this thing where the camera starts off completely sort of on its side or upside down and it spins into the right like angle as they're walking in the door, right? You know, they're cutting through the, the airlock or whatever and the camera sort of spins into the right place. The reason why it does that is because the ship's actually flipped on its side. So it starts up where it would actually be like right for the floor of the ship, but then it flips to like fit where you know the actual gravity where the actors are standing because they're because they're effectively walking on the wall as they're coming in. So the point I'm making is is that if you're going to do a fancy camera thing, there should be a Very reason well directed. F- there should be a reason for it. There should be something in the scene that it, it benefits and ties to. And that's a really simple one, but it's there. Yep. So, so uh, points. I'm not shitting on anything else. I'm just saying why this one works. Okay. Some, something. <laughs> Any further conclusions you may get from that is completely on you, the audience. Or Tara. <laughs> I, I don't know what your end game is here. <laughs> If you're trying to get me to not come back or 
uh, I have no end game. <laughs> my, my, my end game is simply to praise good things in this show. Mm-hmm. That is my end game. Yep, very, very good show. Very good episode. Let us know what you thought of it in the comments. Like and subscribe, ding the bell for notifications, all that stuff. Check out other Star Trek reviews that I did with Connor. We're doing Next Gen. We're about to start Deep Space Nine. Uh, so go check out those. Uh, we did the original series as well. Uh, check out our, uh, I'd say our, I mean myself and Tara, uh, our science fiction movie podcast, The Atomic Serum Experiment over in Male Fuzz Movies. Go and have a look at that. Or you can get it on a podcast feed if you would prefer. Um... So go do that. And of course, you can support all the content uh, by hitting the super thanks button or going to patreon.com slash TV and supporting the show for as little as a dollar per month and get some bonuses for your trouble. Um, but go and have a look. So thank you very much for joining us. We always appreciate it. Keep watching Star Trek. And somewhere out there in another dimension, another, another like Earth, you know, in the multiverse, there is an Earth where the chosen one who is tortured... <laughs> to feed this planet and ultimately dies a slow painful death is named Wesley William Crusher <laughs> <laughs>